Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 92 Obsessed War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Minors. Being allowed to date is probably one of the most exciting developments in a teenager's life, but for parents, it should be the opposite. Although it's cute and adorable to see the spark of new love shimmering behind young eyes, we should all know better than to applaud. For we, as readers of the news and followers of true crime, must know that domestic violence does not discriminate by age, and that obsessive relationships rife with abuse can envelop 15-year-olds just as easily as they can an adult man or woman. It's just hard to imagine it could happen to a teen that you care about. This week on Murderous Minors, we look at two soul-crushing stories of young love turned homicidal, and two promising teen girls whose lives were violently ended by boys who said they'd love them. This episode contains descriptions of self-harm, domestic violence, and sexual assault in addition to senseless murder. Please be advised. It's shocking to the core imagining fresh-faced teens dealing with threats of physical violence from a partner or ex, but that's exactly what it seems that 15-year-old Karen Perez of South Houston, Texas was enduring back in May 2016. She had just celebrated her milestone birthday in January and was a freshman at South Houston High School. In an interview, her mother told local ABC 13's Myra Moreno that she hadn't planned on throwing Karen a quinceanera, but pulled together the funds soon after, giving her daughter a magical birthday she'd never forget. In her home, Karen's mother had her photograph from the party on display, where she's wearing a tiara and a pink gown fit for a princess. Just a few weeks after that unforgettable night, on Friday, May 27, 2016, Karen's ex-boyfriend, 15-year-old Jesus Campos Jr., texted her at school. He told her to skip class and meet him at the school tennis courts, after which they walked to a taco shop just feet away from the high school campus on Shaver Street. He threatened to kill her if she didn't do as he said, telling her that, quote, her life would end on bloods. So she went, with the taco shop surveillance cameras capturing the pair, with another teen boy, entering, inside the restaurant, and exiting. The first footage from outside shows Karen walking in ahead of the two boys, with Jesus clutching her large bag as he fumbles with his pockets outside the entrance. After they ate, cameras inside captured the trio leaving, with Jesus and Karen in front holding hands and their classmate walking behind them. Karen now has her bag slung over her shoulder as they exit and head over to some abandoned apartments, commonly referred to as the Bandos, located less than 1,000 feet from the high school grounds. The former Bella Vista apartment complex boasted 180 units, all empty and available for mayhem by anyone looking for a quiet place to do whatever they want, day or night. The property at 1600 Avenue M had been vacant for over eight years since 2008's Hurricane Ike caused it irreparable damage and also buried the beach at High Island where Coral, Henley, and Brooks had buried some of their victims almost four decades earlier. Dean Coral's Pasadena, Texas home, where he killed six and lost his own life, 
is just two miles down Shaver Street from South Houston High School and the old Bella Vista Apartments. Though the owners claimed to have off-duty police officers on patrol, neighbors couldn't tell and condoms and drug paraphernalia riddled the grounds. Once they'd hung around for a bit, their classmate left and the couple were left alone in an abandoned apartment. We are only aware of the horrible details of the events that followed because Campos used his cell phone to record himself as he raped his ex-girlfriend. Though the screen was black, audio was captured of Karen telling him that she didn't want to do this before the assault continued. Even more heartbreaking still is that Campos didn't stop there. He continued recording as Karen repeatedly told him she didn't want to die, and he choked her to death. The probable cause statement reads, quote, You can clearly hear the defendant forcing the victim to have sex with him. He even calls her by name. You can hear the victim saying she does not want to do this. You can hear the defendant choking the victim. You can hear the victim stating, I don't want to die. Campos took photos of Karen as she lay lifeless, including a picture of him stepping on her face, before he concealed her partially dressed body in the cabinet beneath the sink in the abandoned apartment. Campos texted these pictures and videos to two other boys along with a text that read, quote, bros before hoes. Six hours later, Campos is again spotted on the taco shop's surveillance cameras, entering disheveled and wet and approaching the counter to ask for a phone to use, saying that he needed to call his mother. He was handed a phone and used it, although it's unknown who he actually called. Karen's mother said when interviewed that she had a feeling her daughter was dead soon after it was determined that Karen was actually missing. She just had a bad feeling, and over the weekend, as Texas EquiSearch members and local police searched for Karen, her mother visited that taco shop by South Houston High School and asked to see the surveillance video. In it, an employee recalled later, she saw her daughter arrive with the boy she had told her not to see anymore and leave with him hand in hand. For a moment, her panic turned to red-hot anger. She told police that they needed to search the boy's home. Jesus Campos Jr. by then was driving around searching for his ex-girlfriend with his father. It was during their search that he said they should go home and told his father that they weren't going to find Karen for she was not alive. Campos Sr. immediately contacted the South Houston Police Department to report what his son had revealed. Once speaking to officers, however, Campos clammed up, saying that he had last seen Karen at the taco shop and hadn't seen her since. By then, though, one of their friends had begun to have second thoughts about staying silent. He phoned Texas EquiSearch the following Monday to say that he'd last seen Karen alive on Friday at the abandoned apartment complex by the high school after the taco shop. Besides Campos, he was the last person to see Karen alive. He described leaving the pair in the apartment and going back to school. All hell had broken loose since. The search had been going on throughout the weekend, but it came to an abrupt halt late on Monday, May 30th, 2016. Following the phoned-in tip, Texas EquiSearch members turned their focus to the hulking empty structures at 1600 Avenue M. It didn't take long for the body of 15-year-old Karen Perez to be located under the sink. Immediately, a memorial full of photographs, balloons, and stuffed animals began to take shape outside the apartment where Karen was found. Local news vans arrived and interviewed Karen's family members and those who lived nearby who were outraged that the empty buildings hadn't been demolished in the almost decade since they'd become uninhabitable, especially due to their close proximity to South Houston High School. And then, police gained access to the records and contents of two cell phones belonging to Campos and fully understood the depravity of his crime. 
The pictures, videos, and texts with his friends were still there, ready to incriminate the 15-year-old boy who had used the strength in his bare hands to murder an innocent girl. Jesus Francisco Campos Jr. was 18 years old when he was convicted of capital murder on November 5, 2018. Karen's mother had been unaware of the details surrounding her daughter's death until the trial, where she and others were also shown the photos and videos taken of the sexual assault and murder. He received an automatic sentence of 40 years to life in prison. He'll turn 21 in 2021 and is currently housed in the Michael Unit of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Prison in Tennessee Colony, Texas, right alongside Elmer Henley Jr. Karen Perez never got to see that frame photo that she took in her tiara and pink dress as Campos murdered her before her quinceanera pictures came back. She never got to learn to drive, graduate from high school, turn 18 or go to college, milestones which Ellie Gould of Calend Wilshire, England was also looking forward to doing just about three years later. A 12th grader at Hardenwish School, Ellie had turned 17 on February 2, 2019, and was busy with school and friends and riding horses, a hobby she loved to indulge in, accompanied by her mother. It was a wonderful way for mother and daughter to spend time together, just the two of them, time her mother would grow to cherish, given the events that were to come. Ellie was a competitive writer as well, who enjoyed supporting the charity Writing for the Disabled. She was even considering using her skills to become a mounted police officer once she was finished with school. But in the meantime, she'd recently gotten a job as a waitress and was focused on studying for her upcoming mock exams. Just before her birthday, she'd shared with her mother, quite excitedly, that a boy from her friend group named Tom Griffiths had asked her out. The woman wasn't aware of the boy, but learned that he was friends with her friend's son, and that made her feel a bit more comfortable that Ellie was likely seeing a nice boy. He'd celebrated Ellie's birthday with her and her family shortly after and had stayed over for dinner. Griffiths even inquired about working at the family business. Ellie's mom didn't have much to say about the quiet boy, however, he wasn't conversational and that just rubbed her dad the wrong way. He just thought that Griffiths and his daughter seemed like an odd match. According to friends, Elliot had a crush on Griffiths for a while and had been trying to date him for months. After he asked her out in January, the pair became the only ones in the friend group to couple up senior year. 17-year-old Tom Griffiths was a quiet, athletic boy who played on the Chippenham Rugby Club and was an avid swimmer, competing locally and at the international level. The young couple continued to date through April, but as the school year was coming to a close, Ellie decided that she needed to concentrate on her classes and her upcoming exams. On Wednesday, May 1st, 2019, she confided in her mom that Griffiths had been acting strangely and was interested in being more serious than Ellie thought they should be. Ellie promised her mom that she would take care of the situation. The next day, Thursday, May 2nd, 2019, Ellie told her friends that the relationship was suffocating her and broke up with Griffiths that afternoon. She messaged a group of friends around 6 p.m. and told them that he hadn't taken the news well, but that she was excited at the prospect of regaining her freedom. The following day, Friday, May 3, 2019, was normal by all accounts, with Ellie's parents heading off to work at their usual times. There were no classes scheduled that morning for Ellie, so she stayed home to study, with a classmate scheduled to pick her up for school at noon. Her ex-boyfriend Tom Griffiths, however, had gone to school, with his mother driving him in from their home in Dairy Hill at the regular time. What she didn't know is that he had no plans to stay there, and security cameras on a bus showed that he'd gotten 